everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome in across the continent. My name is Jesse. I'm here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and welcome back to another exciting broadcast with us. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, so welcome back as we continue our mission of showcasing the coolest scientists and explorers on planet Earth. As many of you may know, February is our entire month solely dedicated to amazing women in STEM. We have done this since our inception, eight years of over, I think, 400 broadcasts in the month of February alone, showcasing the coolest people on planet Earth. We've literally broadcast from every continent, I think 90 countries in February. It's a wild ride. Now, one of my all-time dream partners for this epic month has been If Then. If you guys have joined us for other broadcasts in the series, you'll know that we succeeded. We are in the midst of a 16-part epic series featuring some of the ambassadors of the amazing If Then initiative. If Then is a brainchild of the Lida Hill Philanthropies who have showcased women in STEM better than literally any other group on planet Earth. They have more resources and stuff than you can shake a stick at. It's all right there. Lots to explore and discover. Now, before I dive in with today's speaker, I want to note two things. Number one, this is our third broadcast. Hey, everything we do is on our YouTube channel. So if you want to hear from Dr. Tay uh, talking about neuroscience, Gracie Ermey talking about COVID and save the world, it's all right there. Lots to explore and discover. And two, we're going to have a Kahoot today. So if you're joining us live, you're joining us on YouTube, you want to play along with a little four question quiz between our talk and Q&A, uh, you can do so with that game pin. About 25 minutes, no need to hurry, but it is there whenever you'd like it. Now, I'm so excited today to bring you Katie Croftbell. She is the founder and head of the Ocean Discovery League, which in part, alongside her illustrious career, means that there's basically no one on planet Earth that has done more to explore the deep sea, to make sure more people can explore the deep sea, and to find ways of exploring it in a more efficient and effective way. So I'm so thrilled to have her on today with us to do a little bit of a deep dive, literally and figuratively, into her amazing career. I hope you guys are as excited as I am. And without further ado, Katie, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the program. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jesse. It's so great to be here today. I'm really, really excited to talk to you guys about the ocean. So let's dive right in. But first, um, you, got, you may think that people like me and um, Becca and some of the others that you're seeing this week have known what they want to do for their whole lives, but that's not always true. There are some people that do, but not me. Um, here's me on a boat when I was really, really little, and I could lie and tell you that I've known that I've wanted to be an ocean explorer for my whole life. I even got to learn how to scuba dive when I was in high school, but still, I didn't actually know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I knew I loved math, I knew I loved science, and I knew I loved the ocean, but I didn't know that I could bring these things together. And it wasn't until I was studying ocean engineering in college and I had the chance to go on a research cruise to look for shipwrecks in the Black Sea. And after that, I was absolutely hooked. Since then, I dedicated all of my studies and my entire career to ocean exploration and have discovered many, many new things all over the world. I'm really, really excited to have had the chance to go to sea so much. I used to spend about two months a year on a research vessel, um, and so it brought me to many amazing places, and I'll share some of those with you in a minute. But first, I want to tell you about some of the things that ocean explorers want to study in the ocean. So why in the world do we want to learn about the ocean? You know, it's big, it's dark, there's some stuff down there, but what really is important about it? Well, there are a lot of things that are important about the ocean. One thing that um, explorers and scientists want to know is what is actually in the water itself. They want to know about the chemistry, the temperature, um, like all the chemicals, the salts, that sort of thing that's in the ocean. Um, we also want to know how water moves around the world. The movement of water and those chemicals and heat all over the planet are really, really important um, for the weather, um, for the climate, and for the things that live in the ocean. So biology is super important, of course, and is often the first thing that people think of. They think about fish and dolphins and sharks and that sort of thing. Um, but there are also all kinds of other amazing creatures, little octopus and crinoids, things like this that you can see in the video. And all all of these animals, um, you know, need to live together or they eat each other. But all of these things, they depend on each other to create a healthy ecosystem deep in the deep sea. 
We also want to know how the Earth works. So looking at the geology, the rocks, the history of Earth and what's happening right now is super important. The video you can see right now are hydrothermal vents. This is an area where water from the ocean goes down into cracks into the seafloor and gets really, really hot and full of chemicals from magma that's very, very close to the surface. And it comes back up and it creates these hydrothermal vents. It's very hot, mineral rich water that's coming up out of the seafloor that also creates um, an ecosystem, an area for these animals that live off of that hot, mineral rich water. And we've only known about these for about 40 to 50 years. It's a relatively new discovery in, um, in the grand scheme of things. And you can see some of the shrimp and fish and crabs and all kinds of things that live on these, um, on these systems that are far away from the sun. And finally, another area that is near and dear to my heart is archaeology or the study of who uses the ocean. Um, people that have been sailing across the seas for thousands of years. Where were they going? What were they carrying? What kinds of connections were being made across different um, countries and cultures? And this is really how I got started in ocean exploration and, and hooked on the whole thing was by um, studying archaeology. So you might think that we've seen a lot of the ocean, but in fact, um, it's really, really hard to do even though it's right here on our planet. You know, we can go to the moon, we can go to, up to space, all kinds of other things, but it's really tough to study the ocean for a lot of reasons. One, it's wet, it's remote, it's really hard to get places. It's deep, there's no air, it's dark, it's cold, it's hot, and it's really, really expensive. A lot of the tools that we need to be able to explore the ocean and overcome all of these challenges cost a lot of money, which is a huge barrier to a lot of people around the world. So because of all these challenges, um, we need a lot of very special tools to be able to get down there and see. You can't see through the water. Um, you can see a little ways through the water, but you can't see very far. So we need a lot of very special tools. There are many things that can be used. Um, also, I will warn you that I'm in the middle of a snowstorm, and if I suddenly disappear, it's because my power went out. But hopefully that won't happen. Um, so back to the tools. Research vessels are a very important tool. This is what brings us out onto the ocean, and we have lots of um, special equipment on board. One of them is called a multi-beam sonar. This is a very, very large piece of equipment that's mounted to the bottom of a ship and it sends sound through the water. The sound bounces off the seafloor and comes back up to the ship. And you can measure the time that it takes for the sound to go ping all the way down to the bottom, bounce off and back. You measure the time and then you can calculate the distance. And that distance over a long, air, a big area, you can use to um, create maps of the seafloor. They're called bathymetric maps. We use those maps to then decide on places that we want to investigate further, things that look particularly interesting. And so there are a lot of different ki kinds of deep submergence vehicles that we then put down into the water to be able to study and get a closer look. So submersibles or human occupied vehicles are one of them. These are um, like little tiny submarines where two or three people usually go inside of them and they have all kinds of sensors on them. Sometimes they have arms so you can pick up samples of rocks or animals um, down on the seafloor. We also have robotic vehicles called remotely operated vehicles. These have no people inside them and they're connected to the ship. Um, they also have video cameras, manipulator arms, samplers, all kinds of sensors to be able to take pictures and video of the seafloor and also sense the environment. So we want to measure things like temperature and salinity or the saltiness of the water, oxygen content, all kinds of other things. Um, and this little video will show you how those things kind of work together. So this is um, Nautilus. This is a ship that I used to work with. I used to run all the operations on Nautilus. And you see this little white line going down. That is a cable that goes down to the two vehicles. This one is called Hercules. And this is the primary vehicle. It can kind of fly around like a helicopter and it sends video and sensor data up to Argus. And then Argus sends all of that up to the ship. And we're sitting on the ship controlling the vehicles, but also sending that information via satellite back to shore. So we can include a lot more people in the exploration 
while we're doing it. So that all goes to a place called the Inner Space Center in Rhode Island and gets sent out all over the world. And you can tune in to um, Nautilus Exploration. That ship is still running. I don't work with them anymore, um, but it's really an amazing program and I encourage you guys to check it out. Um, when we're on the ship, we usually work in a room that looks something like this. This is um, uh, from a different ship called the Okeanos Explorer. And you can see the video coming up from the bottom and all kinds of other information, maps and sensor info. And you use all that. You have to look at everything constantly. It's kind of like the bridge on um, Star Trek where you see all the data coming in and you've got to figure out what you're going to do with that information to make decisions about the science and what you're doing. Um, another type of vehicle that doesn't have people in it and is not connected to the ship is called autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, so these you'll program and send them off overboard like on this crane and then they go and collect information about the seafloor and then come back and then you, you download the data from the vehicle once it comes back. And one area that is quite new um, has just been increasing in the last few years is low cost deep sea technology. So I told you a little bit earlier that a lot of this equipment, the ROVs, the research vessels, the AUVs are usually very, very expensive. So not a whole lot of people are able to do this kind of work. Um, so my organization, the Ocean Discovery League and, and several other people around the world right now are working on ways to make it um, less expensive to be able to study the deep sea. And so you can see these little structures, these little cameras that and um, sensors that we've been developing over the last few years. So it's really exciting that we're able to open up this field to more people around the world. Now, you might think that we've found all there is to find in the ocean. We have all these amazing tools, but I've done a little bit of math, some calculations to figure out just how much of the seafloor we've seen with human eyes and video cameras and still cameras. And over the last 50 years or so, using the tools like the ones I just showed you, I think that we've only covered an area about the size of Rhode Island, which is the smallest state in the United States. It's also where I live. Looks big on this map, but if you zoom out, it's that little white dot there. You can see that there is a ton left to explore, and we need students like you to love and study and explore the ocean. So I'm really excited that you're here today to um, look at this with me. Now, what have we discovered? Well, even in that little tiny area, we've discovered quite a lot of things. So you can imagine what the other 99% of the ocean holds. It's amazing. So I'm going to take you on a little tour of some of the places I've been over the last um, 20 or so years. So this is the Aegean Sea off the coast of Turkey, and Turkey is where I started to fall in love with ocean exploration. So this is an ancient shipwreck. It's probably 1,000 to 1,500 years old, and all these little jars would have been carrying oil or um, wine or some other thing. It's like the 55 gallon drum or the uh, the beer bottle or the, the soda bottle of the Mediterranean. So this big pile of, they're called amphoras, would have been inside the hull of a ship and taking it from wherever um, the product was made and taking it somewhere else in the Mediterranean Sea. So that was off the coast of Turkey and we found dozens and dozens of shipwrecks off of Turkey. It's very exciting. Um, another place that's very near and dear to my heart is Colombo Volcano. Um, it's very near to a another volcano called Santorini, which is where I did my PhD work, my um, graduate work. But Colombo is a very small underwater volcano just off the coast of Santorini. And in here, you can see this orange, this white, these are called chemosynthetic bacteria, which again is where water is getting um, very mineral rich and very hot from magma that's very shallow underneath the, the seafloor. So it's coming up and it's making, and in this case, there is a lot of carbon dioxide in the water. So you can see that there's no fish in this video compared to the one that I showed you earlier. There are no crabs, there are no other animals because it's too acidic for anything else to live in here. So here, all that can live is, are these bacteria that are growing off of that mineral rich water that are coming out. And you can see these bubbles. These bubbles are full of carbon dioxide that are coming up out of the seafloor from the volcano. 
Um, now moving over to the Straits of Sicily, this is in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of, um, of Italy. We were there, it was Halloween night several years ago, and we were studying volcanoes here because it's a very active uh, geological area. But even though you're studying volcanoes, you never know what you might find. And on Halloween night, somebody was writing into the website, Nautilus Live, and said, hey, have you ever found an airplane? Um, on the bottom of the seafloor. And we said, no, we haven't, but you know, you never know. And then about 30 seconds later, this came into view, this airplane on the bottom of the seafloor. Um, we believe that it is from a battle, World War II battle off of Pantelleria, and it's an Italian plane, um, and it went down in 1942, and they had not found it previously. So we um, gave it to the local officials, and so they're able to, to um, do what they want with it. Now we cross the Atlantic over to Kickham Jenny Volcano. So you can see a common theme. Volcanoes are very exciting in the ocean. Um, so Kickham Jenny is a volcano off of um, an island called Grenada in the Caribbean Sea. And here we had been studying the volcano itself, which looked very similar to Colombo actually, but there it was less acidic. So there were animals inside it. And then we decided to go and look out look at the slopes, the outer slopes of the volcano. And we had no idea that we were going to find this area where we think it's methane coming up out of the seafloor, but has been squished by a landslide. So we've got a lot of organic material coming up, being squished by a landslide coming up out of the seafloor. And because of that, there are all these mussels living there and an octopus you can see, um, sea cucumbers, a bunch of other things. Those, these mussels, these aren't like the ones that um, you know grow on a dock in shallow water and you can eat from a restaurant. These things are using that methane that's coming up out of the seafloor to live and grow and to make food for themselves. It's too much too deep for, um, for eating mussels. And they are gigantic. These are the biggest mussels that are known in the world. They're about 14 inches long. I think the longest one was about that big. They're huge and unbelievable. This was the very last day of this cruise um, about 10 years ago. It was a super exciting discovery. Um, now moving up to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is off of Texas. And this had been found. It was actually a sonar target that had been found previously. And the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer had found this um, shipwreck called the Monterey Wreck, which sank, um, we believe, in the 1800s or so. And so my, uh, the Nautilus, we were sent back to go check it out to do some more surveys, um, get more detailed information about it, and collect some of the artifacts so that the archaeologists could study it further and try to understand more about the history of this wreck. Also in the Gulf of Mexico, very different from a shipwreck, and I actually was not on board for this one. I had just had a baby about one or two weeks prior, and you can see what is coming up. If you had told me that we would be able to see whales from the ROV prior to seeing this, I wouldn't have believed you because the vehicles are kind of loud underwater and we think that they scare off a lot of things, particularly whales, which are very sensitive to sounds underwater. But this is a sperm whale that came and you can see it's swimming upside down underneath Hercules right now. And it's checking out the vehicles and it just kept swimming around and around and around for quite a long time, checking out what we were doing, why we were there. So we stopped the vehicles and just sat there and let it do its thing until it was, you know, its curiosity was satisfied and then it swam away and we were able to continue our work. Off of California, similar but not quite the same. There is a whale fall. A whale fall is where, you know, what happens to a whale after it dies, it sinks down to the bottom and because becomes food for other animals. So this is one that had actually, it was a whale that had washed up on shore in San Diego and scientists were able to tow it offshore and sink it down to the bottom so they can study it. 
It was important to understand how things um, colonize different areas, including whales. So only, there are some animals that only live on whale falls and scientists are trying to understand how they move from dead whale to dead whale across the seafloor. So they were, this um, little pile of line was probably holding an anchor, some weight to make it go down to the bottom. And they go back to it periodically to study the animals that come to it first and, and eat away the flesh and now you can see the white and yellow on the bones, and that's bacteria that are eating eating away the bones now. And finally, I think I have one more video left. So all the ones that I've shown you so far have been um, collected with ROVs or um, remotely operated vehicles, mostly from the Nautilus, so ROV Hercules. Um, but the last one I'm going to show you is very special because this was... Um, done with Makanu, that little tiny camera system that my team is developing. And it was the very first cruise or expedition that was led in the Seychelles, a country in the Indian Ocean near Madagascar and off the coast of Africa, by someone from the Seychelles. So in many cases, um, you know, Americans or Europeans have tools and they go to another country to be able to do work and oftentimes work with people who live there. But in many places, they don't have the tools to be able to study the deep sea. So this was the first time that somebody from the Seychelles was leading an expedition in her own country, which is super exciting. And they were able to find this. So you can see all these shrimp and fish swimming around. And what's gonna come by? You see a little bump. Boom. Six gill shark came to check out the bait that she had put down with her camera, which is why all these animals are there. So they're trying to see what are the animals that live in the, the deep waters of the Seychelles. So I will leave it at that and would be happy to take any questions. First of all, that was amazing. And that was some of the best footage we've ever featured in. Like I posted 1500 of these. That was like amazing. The whale by itself is so freaky and weird that we were able to see that that we know that sperm whales go down that far but the fact that we have footage well, I you never see them that's the no. thing like we've had so many people ask like oh have you ever seen a whale have you ever seen this and you're like no because the vehicles are so loud and they would be scared off but then there it is very curious sperm whale my all-time dream, which is it's unlikely even with all the exploration we're doing now, is to see a sperm whale hunt a giant squid in the deep sea. Because it's, oh, well, yeah. it's the biggest battle in the history of nature. Like it's like this monstrous leviathan taking out this like primeval creature with hooked tentacles and dinner plate eyes, and it's just it's like black magic beneath the waves. Um, Katie, that one day, one. one day we'll get it. One day, one day. I want to see an oarfish too. I think that would be really cool. Thank you. You're even mentioning oarfish. You know what? I'm gonna put the name on the screen for a second because everybody should look up oarfish when you're done. They're so freaky. They're one of my favorite things in all of nature, and like you just don't see them. They're the longest fish in the world. They're yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah, they wash up on shore. Like some most times, people have seen them dead, but not alive. I like that you went to like illustrate it with your arms. We're like, yeah, you, like yeah. You know that, much bigger, <laughs> way bigger than the arms. You're bigger like, than the video. Oh dear. Uh, well, before we dive in with our Q&A, YouTube friends, you guys can share them in the chat. Live classes, we're coming to you in a minute. We're going to begin with a little Kahoot. So this is going to test some understanding, have a little bit of fun. Our grade 11s, this might be a little easy for you, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, for those who are new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. And what you win is Katie and I's everlasting respect. So no pressure at all. Um, and Katie, if you want to give us hints for any of these in our final few seconds of each question, you're welcome to chime I in. I don't even know what the questions are. I know, I I know but I bet you know the answers. I have a good feeling that you're going to get these pretty <laughs> speedily. Um, but let us know if you don't, because that'll make the kids feel like a million bucks. All right, true or false, the deep ocean is the largest habitat on Earth. We've been talking about this. We've been talking about exploring it. We've been talking about how little we've explored in it. 
the, it, the degree to which this answer is correct is shockingly true. Like it's not even close. And yeah, I mean, not even like, close. Not even, I, what is it like 95% of all livable habitat on earth or something is deep sea. Like it's, it's absurd. Yes, and we, it is. Barely scratched earth. So most of you got this right. Yes. It like, it's not even close. Every time we go to the deep sea and we're really looking, we find new species. That is every time. Astonishing. We had a scientist on uh, a few years ago and we said, how many species have you found? She's like, I literally don't remember. Like there's, she's found so many new creatures. She can't even keep track, which is absurd. So charming bat takes our lead. Okay. Taking us to question two, the point of the ocean is how far down. So interestingly, this has been explored a lot. When I was a kid, only two people have been to the bottom of the ocean. And now we're at many more than that. James Cameron was third in the submersible to go down to the Marriott Trench. Now, yep. a few explorers have been. Is it 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, or over 30,000 feet, which is deeper than Mount Everest is tall? Anyone who's ever done a Kahoot with me knows that I always go for superlatives. And so our answer is yes, it's over 30,000 feet. Katie, would you go down to the bottom if you could? Or is that, what do you think? I'm curious. That's a good question. Uh, well, particularly with the, um, I'm blanking on the name of the vehicle that's been down so many times now. Limiting factor? Yes, that. Yes. Given that they have so much experience under the belts now, yeah. Okay. I'm always interested because we get a lot of uh, astron astronomers and engineers and stuff, and we say, would you go to space? This is like the exact equivalent of this, but in the deep sea, and I'm thank you for that answer. Exactly. All right. Yeah, but uh, I've most most of my work has been done with robotic vehicles. I haven't even been in a submersible before. Like, do you need I've, to I've dived, and I've used lots of robotics, but that's it. Well, well, not that's it. Those are both very cool things. But if anyone with <laughs> a candidate for all time submersible needs to go immediately, it is you. I'm going to write someone a letter, okay, when we're done this project. <laughs> the Canadian way. All right, question number three. There's life on the ocean floor. This is very easy. I just want to I hope it. you guys get this one because I showed you a whole lot of it. <laughs> you know what? I drive this point home because, like, people don't know this. I was talking to someone literally the other day who said that she went to a UN meeting and they were like, there's life down there? Like, what are you talking about? There's nothing down there, which could just be a very – a confused individual, but yes, it's teeming with life. There's like a yes. bazillion things. Like this little it's Christmas crazy. tree worm here. Yes, who's the best? That is like, aren't they the coolest creatures? I love They're them. They're so cool. All right, we're going to our final question with Daring Raccoon in the lead with Green Ooh, Raccoon. It's close. Raccoon day. Okay, this is a multi-select, so there's more than one answer here, but I always like to harp on this Ooh. when we talk about deep sea explorers. Uh, what kinds of jobs can you have? Cook, submersible pilot, biologist, photographer, maybe there's a hint here that it could be more than these. This is one of the joys that we like to feature in all our broadcasts is that if you're interested in this stuff, if you're interested in space or deep sea exploration or the jungle, a bazillion rules out there for you. You do not need to be as epic and awesome as Katie. If you are great, but like there's lots of options to get involved in these really amazing projects and whatever your interests are, whatever your skills are, there's a role for you. And I always like to drive that point home. So, and not only that, we need all the roles to be able yes. to accomplish these amazing things. You can't just have one PhD on a ship. You need the cook. You need the engineers. You need the bosun. You need everybody. Yep. Thank you for saying bosun too, which is the greatest nautical term of them all. <laughs> I don't know. Um, baggy wrinkles, a pretty good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you are any of those folks in the coat, let us know who you are in the chat. We have our like all time Kahoot champions, which are Mr. Shadis class and they always win. And they're very, getting to it's going to their heads i think um so we'll check in with them in a minute if they were the winners in that but no matter what thank you for participating everyone and we're going to go live with our q a now so mr hancock georgetown if you guys want to kick us off with a question i'm coming to you to uh, start us off hey. all right awesome thanks so much katie it was a great presentation uh, our original question was have you ever seen a shark uh but that got answered uh what type of shark was it Ooh. Oh, we've seen lots of different kinds of sharks, you know, dogfish, six gills. Um, actually, when we were off of Santorini, one of the coolest things was there was an area with lots of corals. And we found, and I wish I had a, a video handy to show you, but I don't. Uh, we found they were either, no, they were shark egg cases that were attached to the corals. And there were thousands of them everywhere. It was like this shark nursery. Um, and they were all in an area where there was kind of warm. It wasn't super hot hydrothermal venting, but it was generally warmer um, in that area than, yes, mermaids' purses. Yes. 
I'm highlighting this because a lot of people don't know that some sharks do lay eggs and everyone should go look at shark eggs because they're the coolest things ever. And I used to work in an aquarium where we had them and you can see through them. Like you can see the baby shark. Yeah, you can put a light behind them and you can see a little baby shark or skates and rays um, have similar kinds of things. Very cool. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Shadows Class, five sixes, welcome in. And uh, how'd you do in the Kahoot? Uh, what's the coolest thing you ever seen? No pressure, Katie. Coolest thing you've ever seen. The coolest thing you've ever seen. Oh my gosh, I've so shown you lots of them. That, well, the shipwrecks um, definitely got me interested in ocean exploration in the first place. And I really, really love archaeology and finding them, but then also understanding the connections between people across the um, across different ocean areas. Um, but I think that the coolest thing is the thing that you are going to find one day on the bottom of the ocean. I'm very excited to see. Me too. I can't even hardly wait. And I want to stress on the scuba diving note and shipwreck note, because our class today, we got a lot of grade fives today. In grade five, you can start on the path of being a scuba diver. At 10 years old, you can get your same scuba certification that I have, which is open water, and literally within hours of all of our classes, so Lake Huron, Lake Ontario, you guys are all close to that, our live classes today, uh, you can go at as a 10-year-old and go scuba dive on a shipwreck. I've scuba dove on a shipwreck. It's like the most amazing experience you'll ever have. It's so, so cool, and it's like a couple hours away, so... It's a cool way to get started. I can't encourage it enough. If you want my help finding dive shops close by, just bug me and I'll send some info to you. But first, learn uh, how to swim. Yes, that's very important. Swimming. If you don't, work. learn how to swim. Uh, Miss Balls class, we're going to head to Goderich. Come on in, grade 11s, and take us away. Hey. Hey, Katie, can you tell us more about how the technology you are developing has been used uh, and what kind of technology you're developing? Sure. Yes. Um, I can show you one of the little cameras right here. So this was one of our original prototypes. It's, uh, it has a camera and uh, temperature and depth sensors and also GPS inside. Um, and this can go to 1500 meters or almost a mile deep in the ocean. And it only costs um, about a thousand or two dollars, which is you know, sounds expensive, but it's way, way less than the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that it costs to build the big ROVs like Hercules. Um, and we've been experimenting with different kinds of deployment systems. You saw some of the PVC structures. So just like putting pipe together and strapping these on and putting them down in the water. Um, I can't remember the second part of the question, but the really cool thing about these is that um, well, A, they don't cost very much. B, they can go pretty deep. Um, a project that we're going to be starting in the next few months, we're going to be shooting for four to 6,000 meters um, and still on the same order of magnitude of cost. So in the like thousands of dollars range, not the tens or hundreds or millions of, of dollars range, um, because we're working with communities around the world that don't have access to these kinds of tools. So we think that if we're able to work with people to develop tools that they're able to access, afford, and then they'll be able to do exploration in areas where it's never been done before. In many places, you have things like fisheries or deep sea mining potentially coming online, um, but the people there, the scientists um, and communities don't have access to these, this kind of data for them to be able to make decisions for themselves about what they wanna do and be able to responsibly manage and, and conserve and protect their ocean areas. Very cool. Thank you so much, Katie. It's such an exciting time in this field because even in my lifetime, like the input just of like drones being everywhere, camera traps being everywhere, eDNA as a technology, like these technologies are really revolutionizing biology, marine science, conservation, like all these things are opening up in such a big way to so many new communities and groups um, because we've taken things down from the million dollar range to the thousand dollar range or the hundred dollar range. And it's just, it's been riveting to see. Honestly, you kids like Planet Earth, which was like one of the most inspiring documentaries to me when I was a kid, like you can film that with your cell phone now. And the the options that are available to you if you're interested in this career are just endless. It's it's, oh, it's incredible. Even in the amount of time that I've been in this field, <laughs> the level of development of technology. And so it's super exciting to see what we're able to do now that was just was not possible when I started. We didn't even have GPS hardly when I first started. <laughs> Very, very cool. Katie, we're going to head back to Mr. Shadows class. YouTubers, don't be shy. If you have any questions there, please do feel free to chime in, but come on back in. Hey. Has, has a whale ever interacted with a boat? Ooh. Has a whale ever interacted with a boat? Um, oftentimes, when you're cruising along, you get not whales 
dolphins, they're cousins of whales. Um, they like to play and swim along in the bow wave as you're cruising along um, on the boat. So that is super, super cool um, to see. And it's really fun to sort of hang over the bow and see these dolphins swimming along with you as, as you're cruising along on the ship. <laughs> Pretty much every time we feature a ship, and we've had the Nautilus on many times, we've had, we have Darwin 200 joining right now. Dolphins really do like to be at the front of a ship. It's like one of the sort of perks of being on the ocean, which is very cool. Oh, it's so much fun. Yes. Thank you, guys. Um, Miss Ball, I'm going to head back to you if you have another question for us. Time flies and you're having fun. So we got time for a few more questions together before we wrap up. But if you want to join us again in Goddard, take us away. Hey. Hi, Katie, again. How has your exploration data been used and who guides your explorations? Is it questions from other researchers or your own questions? A uh, combination of both, actually. Um, when I was with the Nautilus, in the early years, it would be um, the, the OET team along with scientists in the countries in which we're working, because in the Mediterranean Sea, everywhere is owned or you know managed by a, a coastal country, right? There's no international waters in the Mediterranean Sea. So we would just work with whomever happened to be there and who, who we got in touch with. In other um, instances, like when we started working in the Caribbean and the Eastern Pacific Ocean, we would have big workshops where we would bring scientists together who were either from that location or interested in doing work there and brought together everybody's ideas about where were the important places to go. And we put those all together on a map and a big report. And then that guided the work that we did when we were in those places. Um, so there are a lot of ways to do it. One big project that we have um, going on right now is starting to look at where dives have been all over the world. So right now we have a database of about 50,000 dives that have been done over the last 50,000 years. And we're trying to see, you know, where are the places in the world that have no dives that have not been explored at all and trying to take a, a more global look at it, not necessarily driven by particular science questions, but rather have we even looked at this at all so that we can start to ask those questions and formulate hypotheses about it, even if you know no one's ever seen it before. So it's like sort of the first step, that exploratory step um, to, to start to understand these places that have never been seen before at all. Yeah. What a cool question. I know one of our ship partners is going on a joint journey around the world over about the next 10 years, and they put forth sort of applications. They're like, we're gonna be in this ocean during this time. And mm -hmm all around the world get to submit and say like we'd like to use the ship for this like here's what we hope to discover here's why we're the ones for the job and then they get picked as sort of like the best team to do that and sort of ship time but these are the most elite of the elite research vessels there aren't many things that are like this on the oceans of the world still um we're really lucky to get to feature a lot of them but this is really valuable time they're really amazing vessels and uh i've never had that question before so thank you Ms. yeah that, that's a great question and th yeah there are a lot of ways to do it um, we're going to take one more question in a minute before we wrap up, but I just want to know if you want to find out more about Katie's amazing work, uh, oceandiscoveryleague.org, so much more to learn and discover there that we can't possibly do in one broadcast. Uh, she's on all manner of social media as well, so I'll make sure all our classes get links to that at the end. You can check out this program on our YouTube channel, and please do join us for the rest of the If Then series. Uh, so many more of amazing people. Tomorrow we've got the neuroscience of love. Uh, we've got, geez. I can't even remember. We've got three things tomorrow, three programs tomorrow. It's going to be an amazing time, 16 over the course of the week. And do check out ifthenshecan.org for more to learn as well. Mr. Shadditz Cloud, we're going to wrap up with you one more time. Come on in and take us away. Hey. So I just want to know, what's your favorite type of fish? Ooh, favorite fish. <laughs> Ooh, favorite type of fish. I think angler fish are super cool. Yeah. Tell us more. Come on. I'm well, because so they, you know, they lure in their prey. They can, they've got the little lure and it can glow and that can lure in prey. But also what's really crazy is that the males bite onto a female and then sort of get fused to them and can't get away. And then they become one and that's how they're able to eventually make babies. It's because they're fused together and it's just this little tiny male that gets stuck to a bigger one, the bigger female. It's, it's like wild. the greatest thing in all of nature, okay? Like if you see an angler fish in pictures, it's almost certainly a female, but the males are just these little like nodules. Just like these little lumps that are stuck on yeah. them. 
Like you've got like a, maybe a mole on your face sort of thing. And that is what a male anger is. You just like melted into you. It's so freaky and weird and awesome. I love it. Thank you for that answer. It's really Absolutely. hard. I should have brought, I, I knit an angler fish that has a little parasitic what? male stuck to it, but it's downstairs. So <laughs> and then next time. Next time. We'll just do a whole program on it. Um, <laughs> it's really rare that we have a scientist willing to answer their favorite animal. So thank you for that question, guys. Uh, class, thank you for joining us. Again, check out the series. Uh, Katie, what we do to wrap up every program is bring in our class to say a big thank you and farewell. So if you're on YouTube and you want to scream out and yell, Mr. Hancock got to head off early to French, but Mr. Shattuck and Ms. Balls class, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day, guys, and we'll see you soon.